welcome to LTV's Top Props. Today we're going to diverge a little bit and talk to a gentleman that has been around props all his life. Many types of props in many different films and television shows. This gentleman's name is Arnold Leibovit. He's an American director, producer, and screenwriter of feature films and musical productions. Now we're going to talk to Arnold who lives on the West Coast, we're on the East Coast. We're going to Skype him in today and talk to him that way. Now Arnold's an acting member of the Producers Guild of America. He has produced, directed, and written several feature films. As part of his career, he has devoted over 40 years to the work of George Pal. His incredible imagination showed the way for a generation of filmmakers and dreamers. His films on space exploration inspired a nation to strive for the heavens. First step toward a bond of merit. I take possession of this planet on behalf of and for the benefit of all mankind. Take a look behind you. Wow, the geography books are right. It's more beautiful than I ever dreamed. When people say this is impossible, it can't be done, I'm already interested. <laughs> The fantasy world of George Pal. Included in the production of the George Pal biopic, The Fantasy Film Worlds of George Pal, for which he received a Cine Golden Eagle Award in the Arts category in 1986 and the George Pal Memorial Award, also known as the Saturn Award from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films in 1987. In addition, he has produced other works focusing on PAL, including the Puppetoon movie. In 2002, he served as the executive producer of The Time Machine, and Leibovitz had earlier obtained the rights to the H.G. Wells book in the 1960 motion picture through the George PAL estate. This film, was produced under the direction of Wells' great-grandson, Simon Wells. But today we're going to focus on George Pal's early works, and Arnold's going, to, Arnold's going to talk about his film that he created in 1985 called The Fantasy Film Worlds of George Pal. So, we're Skyping you in today, Arnold, and welcome to the show. Great, great to be here with you, Carl. So, uh, what, can you give us a short little bio about yourself? Where do we begin? <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> birth. You want to go to the the birth canal? Uh, um, well, I've been. Uh, I was born in Miami Beach, Florida. Um, I always had an interest in film. Uh, even as a as a kid, I used to make films with my uh, my brother. Uh, Maybe it was 10 or 11 years old. We used to take, we had a eight millimeter sound uh, camera, which was very unusual for the time because nobody had those things. And we used to shoot uh, little documentaries and travelogues and so forth. And I guess I always had an interest in uh, film. Um, when I was growing up, I was, taken by a number of iconic uh, filmmakers. I guess my first uh, that I can remember probably was uh, Cecil B. DeMille, uh, The Ten Commandments. I think the thing that, that got me interested in it was probably the just the spectacle of it and the, the special effects. But I would say the top, my top uh, influences were, uh, were George Pal, of course, we will talk about. Walt Disney, of course. He was everyone's avuncular father on television. You couldn't be not, you know, inspired by Walt. Um, 
and uh, Ray Harryhausen. And it's funny because all the people that I admired, all the people that I looked up to, I got to know or meet all of them, including Walt Disney. Wow. And uh, that meant that was a big deal for me to be able to, as a kid, to be able to uh, to see these people older, I was became closer friends with Ray, and then George, of course, I met him probably in the late '70s. Okay, I was I was working on a film. Uh, I was working on a special effect film, science fiction film that I had written with another writer in Los Angeles. It was um, a uh, monster film, sort of a Jaws on Land movie. And I was friends with uh, Dan O'Bannon, who wrote Alien. Okay. And Dan uh, was, uh, I was very, 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 very close to him. And, you know, I, he saw what I was working on. And he said, you know, you should take the project to George Powell. And I said to him, is he still alive? You know, I wasn't following his career right. at that point. See? I didn't really know where he was. So uh, I called uh, I called George's office. I talked to Gay Griffith, which was his assistant. And they set up a time for me to see him. He worked out of his home at that time. He had his offices at Paramount. But... Uh, over time, he eventually moved it to his house, and he had his home, uh, office in his home. So I met him at his house, and uh, I was uh, sitting in the living room, and around me were, well, these puppets were in his house, the very ones you've seen, uh, the Academy Awards that he won. There were, you know, dozens of awards from all over the world that he had won. Uh, and I was just sitting there waiting for him to come out. And in front of me was a book on the table. Uh, it was Gail Morgan's The Films of George Powell was sitting in front of me. Wow. And it was, it was a shot of uh, the war machine from War of the Worlds. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, you know, <laughs> here I am in this place, and here's the guy that made this, this film, The War of the Worlds. I'm thinking, my God, it's like, it was unbelievable thought. And so from the back room, this man comes walking out. Uh, he had, a, uh, he had a, a jacket on, he had one of those, uh, those scarves tied around his neck, you know, kind of an older gentleman uh, look. You know, and he, he came out, and there was George. Wow. And uh, he was the sweetest man. He was just absolutely the sweetest man you can imagine. He was so warm and friendly. He had a wonderful Hungarian uh, charm about him. He was born in Budapest. Uh, my grandmother was born in Budapest. Mm. So there's some synergy there, I think, because I'm part Hungarian. Right. That might have something to do with our connection, cosmically or whatever. And uh, George was just very open, very friendly. He was interested in my project. He wanted to know all about it. I told him I, uh, I told him, oh, I'd love to get Rod Taylor to be the uh, actor. <laughs> I said, do you think we could get Rod? I said, oh, he said, sure, sure, we can do that. <laughs> He has, to lose, he has to lose a little weight, he said, uh, but he, uh, he was very nice about it, you know. And uh, so I stayed in touch with, uh, with him for the better part of a year, and, uh, and that was actually the last year of his life. Okay, so he passed away in 1980, correct? Um, mm -hmm. And so in 1985, uh, you began work, or maybe you started earlier than that, on a documentary called The F Fantasy Film Worlds of George Pell. Can you tell me the story of, of how you finally came about doing that? So I was down in Florida, and then I, 
I heard from Mrs. Powell because I had been in touch with her. We, we were communicating even then. And I had, she told me that George had passed away. And of course, it would struck me very hard, uh, quite significantly, actually. And it was not a good time for me because my father had died. I was already going through that whole experience. And then I find out about George. And uh, Mrs. Powell sent me a copy of George's uh, eulogy that was actually uh, given by Forey Ackerman uh, at his funeral. It was beautifully written. I still have a copy of it. And um, I told Joka, I stayed in touch with her. Joka was her first name. Joka stands for Elizabeth in, um, in English. Joka, it's Z-S-O-K-A, Joka was her Hungarian name. Okay. And uh, I stayed in touch with her and I said to her, you know, we really should do something for George. We should do some tribute to him. And she, that was 1980. And she had heard this sort of thing from a lot of people. But you know, the way things go, people just talk, you know, nothing really always happens. It's not easy to do these things. So it was about three or four years later, actually, four years had gone by. I stayed in touch with her. I was in Chicago working on projects. And I just uh, started uh, tooling around and saying, I started writing a proposal to do a film on George Powell. Uh, and it was around 1982, 83, something like that. And then I went about trying to put the pieces together to make it. And I was driven to make it. I mean, it was not just some idle idea. I, I felt so strongly about it. And I started to put together a proposal. I went to the um, various places. I went to the American Film Institute. Uh, they turned me down. I obviously was in touch with the Motion Picture Academy. They were very interested in the uh, project. Um, they eventually made a special uh, George Powell lecture at the Academy that was set up by Ray Bradbury and a few of his friends. So they are very interested that I was interested in doing a Powell film because they had set up this lecture at the Academy it was one of the first meetings I had when I went out to Los Angeles was to meet with the Academy. And they were very supportive of my project, but only as a support. There was no financial support. Right. And that was very difficult. I couldn't uh, get anyone interested, really. Finally, uh, I had to do it myself. Myself and my brother and some financial friends were able to put together some dollars for it. Uh, we, I had very little money to do it. It's almost, this has been the story for all of these projects, all these preservation ideas. Uh, it's, they're very hard projects to do. And uh, we eventually did most of it, but on a very tiny budget. And I needed help from everyone to make it. Right. Uh, I did get interest from public television. I met with uh, KCET in Los Angeles, and uh, I became friends with one of the uh, major producers or executives at the station, and he actually agreed to do it. He actually agreed to do it. He came up with a budget for it, and I was working with public television, but for the amount of money that they were going to give me to make the film and the time constraints of doing these interviews, and I wanted to do... You, we know what ended up happening, how many we ended up interviewing. We, we'll talk about that. There, it, was, it would never have been enough money to be able to accomplish what I ended up accomplishing. Um, I know when I did my interview on Turner Classic Movies a year ago with Ben Mankiewicz, he was asking me, and they were a lot of them asked me, how did you get so many people in the right. film? Right. Because it, it, it's very unusual to be able to get 
a lot of so many different people, mainly because cost factors, the amount of time you have to wait between doing the interviews, uh, availability, uh, setting it up. Usually you're on a very narrow constraint. You have to do a film, say, in eight weeks or six weeks, and you got to get whatever you can get in that period of time. Well, I just didn't buy that. My feeling was I had to do it all. Otherwise, I wasn't interested in doing it. So I waited. In other words, if it took a year or two years, I waited for the people to be available. I stayed in touch with them. And when they were available, I, I went and I did the interview. So instead of an eight-week schedule, which is basically what public television was telling me, I ended up doing a, a, a 75 week schedule. Nobody could do that. It's, it's, you know, it's, un, it's unaffordable. Uh, George is too important. George was perhaps the most, one of the most important motion picture figures of the 20th century. He's He's a peer of Walt Disney's. He was a friend of Walter Lance. He's a friend of Walt Disney's. He was as important as Cecil B. DeMille, who he ended up working with, D.W. Griffith. Uh, he represents one of the great landmark producer directors of motion pictures in the 20th century. Uh, his contributions to the field of motion pictures in the field of science fiction and fantasy and animation rivals anyone in the industry. There's no one that even can compare to George Powell because he did everything. He was a writer. He was a director. He was an artist. He was an animator. Uh, he knew about music. Uh, he drew his own drawings. He, uh, he, he did his own directing. He conceived of the scripts. He came up with the modeling that he did in the films. He understood special effects. He invented stop motion animation techniques that had never been done before in Europe with the puppetoons. He was a genius because he could do anything. And on top of it all, he was the nicest, sweetest human being that I've ever known, and that probably many have never known before. Uh, he was extremely self-effacing man. He was always, he was a very humble man. Um, had a great sense of humor. He was funny, he was giggling all the time. He had this wonderful sense of life. You, you couldn't help love him. When you were with him, you couldn't help fall in love with him. You loved him. He was someone, when he got excited, Ray Harryhausen told me, when he got excited about something, you were excited. He, 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 he got you, you know, totally uh, immersed in, your, in the idea. But he did it in a, in a very nice way. He did it in a very uh, friendly way. And I heard that from everyone that I interviewed that worked with him. Uh, Chesley Bonestell, who was the great astronomical artist I interviewed, he was 93 years old when I interviewed him. And he remembered. And it was an amazing interview. And he, he told me that uh, George had a wonderful way of putting things to people. He, he never put upon you uh, his, it didn't seem like he was putting upon you his idea. It was almost like he was letting you give you your idea. It's like he allowed the person to contribute himself rather than say, oh, do this or do that, and this is what I like, and this, no. He, he managed to somehow in a very, uh, a very uh, uh, friendly, uh, beautiful way kind of gave you the sense that you were in control of the idea. But then it's funny because it was his idea. But at the same time, it was almost like you were coming up with the idea. It doesn't mean you didn't have great things to contribute. It's just he had this wonderful way of doing it. 
for, for any of the audience members that may not be that familiar with all of George Pal Pal's works, can you um, kind of give us a quick outline of some of the more famous uh, works of George Pal? Sure. Uh, well, let's start. Uh, the most famous, of course, uh, is, wait a minute, <laughs> that one there. Yeah, I'm familiar with that one, yeah, the time machine. Yeah. I mean, that to me is the most famous for me, and I, we can talk about that. Now, you can't see in the room, but I have War of the Worlds over here. We can do that later. War of the Worlds is probably his most uh, successful film. And it's the film that has a great deal of notoriety. Even today, audiences pack the house to see it. They do for both of these films. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, they struck people in a certain way. So it's a very interesting story how when George was making his puppet tunes, goes to Paramount, then has access to the story departments, and then he discovers these two projects that DeMille was going to do. And of course, he's working with DeMille at Paramount, and he goes to DeMille, and he says, I'm interested in When Worlds Collide first. So he had done Destination Moon, which right. is another well-known film. Destination Moon was the first space film in Technicolor 2 that was made. And it was very successful, and Paramount saw how successful it was. They saw the lines outside of the block in New York. Uh, Bar Barney Balaban was the head of Paramount, and he was so impressed. He said, who is this guy that made uh, Destination Moon? So they, they brought George into Paramount to uh, make films. So when he, when he went to DeMille and said, I'm interested in this, when worlds collide, DeMille was actually very interested in George because he, he, he impressed him. And he knew that he knew the special effect and science fiction area, so they let him make it. It's a very interesting story. Um, and when, when worlds collide became a success, George already was working on other projects. He had already wanted to do War of the Worlds, believe it or not. He knew about it from the 1930s. It was a very well-known story. George was already interested in making War of the Worlds. When he found out Paramount had it, it was like he wanted to do it, and they said yes. And DeMille was his advocate. DeMille, uh, DeMille was on the set when he made the film, both films. DeMille was there. Uh, and uh, I mention it only because they have a they have a DeMille like quality. Both when worlds collide and War of the Worlds had all the forces of Paramount when he made them. The, every department of Paramount was involved in the making of those two films, and you can see them. They're very uh, they're more epic looking, like DeMille. They have a larger cast, the special effects. It's, it has a scope to it. A lot of scope, if you watch those films, they really are DeMille-type movies. Right. George had the benefit of DeMille and uh, Paramount, but of course, he, he was really responsible for the movie. He, he came up with everything. But uh, him and Byron Haskin, who directed it. However, uh, the success of those films is what catapulted George because what he was doing, and as I've talked about in many interviews, is George was making epic science fiction. What differentiated George Powell movies from other people that were trying to make science fiction and fantasy movies is he was doing it on an epic scale. Right. His movies were in technicolor. They were big. They were being shown in theaters all over the world. And he's the first one that gave science fiction and fantasy a platform for a mass audience. And that's what differentiates George from, say, some of the smaller people that were doing science fiction movies. Uh, George was the one that set it apart and launched the genre and made it so popular that even as you see today, or over the past uh, 75, 80, 90 years, let's say, since George made his 
films, the science fiction and fantasy genre has become the most successful genre in the history of motion pictures. And George is the one that really invented, he's, he's called the father of science fiction and fantasy in modern film. Right. Because he, he really created the genre for modern audiences. Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe, uh, fantasy films like Tom Thumb, uh, The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm, Doc Savage, which uh, is being remade, uh, and a few others. And by the way, every George Powell movie is seeing remakes or redos by the studios. And I'd say almost every film. And Spielberg is responsible for uh, several. I've done The Time Machine. Right. Spielberg did War of the Worlds. Um, Atlantis was being redone. I mean, every film, it's another film, Atlantis, The Lost Continent, which I happen to love. Uh, when George wanted to do The Time Machine, which I think is important we talk about. Right. When George finished War of the Worlds, the, the Wells estate... Uh, was so impressed, it was actually H.G. Wells' son, um, who was so impressed by War of the Worlds, he came to George and he said, uh, would, you, would you be interested in doing the time machine? You know, the time machine was always considered the gem of the Wells estate. Everyone wanted to do the time machine. People came to him for years to do it. Frank Wells, H.G. Wells' son, was so impressed with War of the Worlds that he came to George and he said, are you interested in the time machine? And George said, of course. Yeah, Powell went to uh, uh, Paramount and they turned him down. That kind of set in motion a certain uh, stormy relationship. It, it already existed anyway. Uh, at Paramount. There was an executive there who really didn't understand science fiction. If it wasn't for DeMille and head of the studio, he overwrote this guy. He was a lower executive, but he was, he was, he didn't understand science fiction and fantasy films. Very few people did, frankly, in the industry. Right. Uh, geez, George fought with that his whole life, his whole career. I mean, this was a time when musicals, and westerns were the were, were the movies of the day. Uh, science fiction and fantasy was always a stepchild to the the bigger musicals and the westerns and the dramas that were made in Hollywood. They didn't understand it. They don't know. They didn't understand what it is. They didn't know how to do it. So George eventually left Paramount and got a better deal at MGM. And uh, they let George make the films he wanted to make when he got there. Plus, he got to control the films. He had more ownership of them. Paramount wasn't willing to do that. I wish they were a little more uh, accommodating to George, because I, I like the look of the Paramount movies a lot. I think because of the scale, I wish that some of that scale could have been translated in some of his later films. but. He knew about the time machine, so he proposed the time machine to the uh, head of uh, MGM at the time, and they let him do it. But the problem is, is they didn't know what time machine was. I mean, can you imagine? This is 1955, right. 56, and he's going to a studio. No one had ever done a time machine before. Nobody even knew what time travel was. And George is saying he wants to do a film about a time machine. They didn't know what a time machine was. How are you going to do a time machine? What's a time machine? I mean, it was a discussion that doesn't seem possible today because people know about these things. Our consciousness has been raised primarily as a result of George, that people know these ideas today. But they didn't know it fully then, the mass audience anyway, and certainly executives. George understood special effects. He was the head of uh, three studios before he ever made a single feature film. In Europe, he was the head of he was the head of the Ufa studio of animation in Germany. He was only 23 years old. 
and he became the head of the animation department of UFA, which was the largest film studio in Europe, in Germany. This was before the Nazis took over. And then he set up his own animation studio in Holland, where he did, made his famous puppet tunes. And he ran a whole department of people. He had dozens and dozens of animators and artists and graphic artists and model makers and everything in a studio in Holland. And he did that for eight or nine years. And then he goes to Paramount, where they hired, they, they liked him to do the puppet tunes in the United States. And he ran the puppet tunes studio for almost a decade. So he had done, he had been the head of three special effect animation studios before he ever even proposed a feature film. It's unbelievable. So he's a very experienced man. And when he came to time to talk about the time machine, he knew special effects. He knew time-lapse photography. He knew stop-motion animation. He was someone who was probably the only person that really understood it. So that's how he was able to pull it off. And he was able to pull it off for a very small budget. They only gave him $850,000 at the time to make the time machine. When we made our new time machine, the one I did with Steven Spielberg in 2002, the machine alone cost three times the budget <laughs> as the whole budget of the original time machine. Right. He had nothing to work with. They gave him pennies. But he was able, as Alan Young told me, uh, he was able to... Uh, a silk purse out uh, of a sow's ear. There you go. He was able to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Right. That's what Alan told me. Right. He knew, he knew how to turn things into, into gold because he had ability of craftsmanship. He understood craft something we've lost, actually. And he understood the intricacies of doing things on a, on a, on a very uh, beautiful, successful way without throwing, you know, all the money you do today at something. I mean, if George was alive today, my God, I can imagine what he would be doing. It'd be amazing. So in 85, when you decided to do the documentary on George Pal, film fantasy world, the fantasy film worlds of George Pal. You put together a, a list of uh, filmmakers, actresses, actors, uh, production people, animators that you wanted to interview. Can you just kind of go through that list of the people that you interviewed back in '85? Uh, it was. It wasn't a difficult list to put together. Uh, well, two things happened. I asked Mrs. Powell, who, by the way, if it wasn't for Joka, and I have to say this, if it wasn't for her, none of this would have been possible. I mean, uh, Mrs. Powell practically adopted me as her, as her second son. I mean, uh, I had a relationship with her. It was almost like she was my, my second mother. Uh, it was a very unusual situation. And uh, she opened up the doors for me uh, in Hollywood. If it wasn't for Joka, I wouldn't have. Nothing would have been possible. Um, she let me go through her rolodex of, of contacts. George George had a book of you know like a directory, your addresses and names of everybody, and she said here. So it had everybody in it. So I would call Charlton Heston or Rod Taylor or Alan Young or anybody, and Joker gave a stamp of approval. She wrote a letter that said that Arnold is doing this project. Uh, please help him. Please cooperate, blah, blah, blah. So as I said, if it wasn't for Joka, I wouldn't have been able to do all the things I did. It was very easy for me in a lot of ways, for some people, because how many people can call Charlton Heston up? And I did that. It wasn't easy for me because, you know, <laughs> I mean, these are people that I admired. Can you imagine? Moses? Right, you called up Moses. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. And here I am talking to the guy that, I mean, it was beyond, beyond comprehension for me to be talking to Charlton Heston and to meet with him. He was wonderful, by the way. 
He was just, uh, oh, just the nicest person in the world. Well, I was going to say, uh, <clears throat> you know, Charlton was one of many in the list that, that you ended up interviewing for your project. Uh, and yeah. people don't understand that very few of these actresses and actors and people sat down to do these types of interviews back then. And historically, you have this archive that you're sitting on of these interviews that nobody has ever seen the complete interviews. They've seen little snippets, correct? They've seen snippets in your film. But nobody right. has seen the complete interviews where they got into a lot of different topics, probably. So this is the archives that you are sitting on. So that's why I want to kind of get an idea of, of some of the names of, of, of the people that you did interview for this project. Yeah, well, we're starting with uh, Heston, and uh, and the list goes down from there. Uh, Rod Taylor, who never did an interview, by the way, on this before. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And the reason for that is what you just said. They didn't do interviews. They didn't really... Uh, there wasn't an occasion to do it, and he, he didn't... Uh, they were very private people. Rod was very... Uh, very private, very protective guy. He didn't, he didn't, you know, Rod never promoted the time machine in public uh, like, like actors do today. You see them out openly promoting movies. Uh, many of these people didn't do that unless they had to. Uh, my uh, interview with Rod was probably the first, one of the first of its kind ever done. Um, I was scared to death. I'm sorry to, I That's diverge okay. every time. I can't help right. it. I, I want to go through the list, but yep. I was scared to death when I did the Rod Taylor interview. Again, you know what I'm talking about, Carl. I mean, you're talking about a film that had so much impact on me as you. Can you imagine what it was like for me to, to meet him? I mean... Uh, to be in his house and for him to let me do this, uh, I was in awe of him. <laughs> he was, he stood on a pedestal as far as I was right. concerned. I thought he was one of the greatest actors. I just love talking to him. I did Alan Young, of course, who was, uh, uh, Philby in the Time Machine, which uh, again was one of the great performances, characterizations uh, that I had ever seen. The uh, and I asked uh, Alan about the camaraderie that he had with Rod, and how George had spent so much time understanding what that meant in terms of the movie, and how that camaraderie was the was the pivotal hinge point of the whole movie. That relationship between him and Alan Young that makes it so so emotional, so uh, resonant today. Uh, there's one of the early interviews, the early interview I did was with Chesley Bonestell. And Chesley was the great astronomical artist who uh, did the Life magazine, uh, the, the very famous picture of the drawing he did of uh, Saturn was on the cover of Life magazine, but he was a wonderful artist. He did, uh, he did, he was an architect. He did the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge he designed, the Chrysler Building in New York. Uh, but he was also a production designer on motion pictures, like The Hunchback of Notre Dame and, uh, and many other uh, films. And he, he became uh, uh, George's artist and conceptualizer for uh, When Worlds Collide, War of the Worlds, Conquest of Space. There was no one like Chesley. So that was one of the early interviews. Then I interviewed Hua Chang. Hua Chang was the original puppeteer. Uh, he worked for Walt Disney. Hua did the Bambi and Pinocchio maquettes for the film. Uh, he became a puppetoon artist, eventually did special effects for George with Gene Warren Sr. on The Time Machine, Tom Thumb, Brothers Grimm, uh, 
Wise, I have him uh, on the uh, uh, GoFundMe that we'll uh, talk about. I talk about him. Uh, he was a contributor to Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. Uh, but he's a he was a brilliant designer, artist, architect, sculptor, everything. Did his interview. Extremely important interview. And that has, that's being restored. Uh, Ray Bradbury. Ray was uh, a huge George Powell fan. Speaking of Disney, because I, I interviewed Roy Disney. Roy E. Disney, this is the nephew of Walt Disney. You can imagine how I felt about that. Right. <clears throat> Roy was amazing. Roy opened up the Walt Disney Studios to me when people knew that I was working. And again, Roy never, rarely, ever had an interview. This is probably one of the first interviews he did. So Roy was very important. Ray Harryhausen was, was there. Ray, Ray was um, Ray's first job in Hollywood was working for George on the puppet tunes. Um, that's how he got his start. He loved George. He had wonderful things to say about him. He worked on the first three or four years of the puppet tunes. And Willis O'Brien, who had made King Kong, was working at the puppet tune studios. I uh, interviewed the people, uh, Gene Roddenberry. My God. Gene and George had their offices across from one another at Paramount. And um, Gene went through a lot of trials and tribulations on Star Trek. It was a very hard project for Gene because nobody understood science fiction, nobody understood space. He couldn't even sell Star Trek to the studio. It wasn't until he came up with the idea that it was a wagon train to the stars that they bought it. They bought it on the basis that it was a Western in space. <laughs> that's how he sold it. Right. That's how, it's, that's how he sold it. Yeah. Anyway, Gene uh, loved George. George was his mentor. I mean, he was very emotional about it. George, uh, he was like a father figure for Gene. And uh, he went to him for advice on the making of Star Trek, um, things that he did. And it's one of the great, rare interviews with Gene Roddenberry. Very important interview. So we had Alan Young, then uh, go back a little bit, Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. First time that Janet Lee and Tony Curtis probably ever spoke about the subject of Houdini, one of George's great movies on the, on the magician, probably the greatest Houdini film ever made. Tony, it was Tony's first movie, Houdini. When he talked about George, he, he, was, he was like I am, he was in tears. He couldn't even talk about it, he was choked up because of how much he loved him and how affected he was by him. Because it was because of Houdini that launched Tony Curtis's career. And Tony was wonderful. Then I did Janet, Janet Lee, sweetest person on the planet. And she talks about Houdini. Uh, and uh, so those are two more. Uh, Tony Randall, who uh, did Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe, never did an interview for it before. <clears throat> first time ever discussing the film. He generally wouldn't talk about it. Uh, he wasn't a big fan of special effect films. And of course, George and him had this wonderful bond. He loved George, like everyone. He told me that there's never been anyone in his life that he's known like George Powell. He loved it, he loved him. It was probably the greatest thing he ever did in his career playing a tour de force of seven characters. Uh, that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience uh, with Tony. Um, then I did um, uh, Joe Dante. I wanted to do Stephen. I contacted Stephen about the interview. At the time, he was very busy, and uh, now he'd probably do it more readily. I ended up doing a film with him. 
but at the time he thought Joe would be better to talk about George. So Joe ended up doing the interview because he had just done Gremlins. And uh, so I had a nice interview with Joe. And of course, I've been friends with Joe ever since, uh, who is a wonderful, another amazingly wonderful individual. Okay, a Robert Block, who did, who wrote Psycho. Right. Uh, he was the original author of Psycho. And uh, Block was a very good friend of George's in science fiction. He was developing projects for him. It's a very rare interview with Robert Block. Uh, Walter Lance. Walter was George's uh, best friend in Hollywood. When he came to the United States, Walter got his citizenship papers for him, become an American citizen. He was very supportive of, of George, and they became lifelong friends. And of course, the story I talk about in my lectures and my appearances is the appearance of Woody Woodpecker in all of George's, many of George's films. Uh, Gene Warren Sr., I have a whole hour with Gene, it's probably the only interview he's ever done. Gene did special effects for all of George's movies, uh, plus other films, you know, Jack the Giant Killer, and right. they did Outer Limits, they did Star Trek. Um, Projects Unlimited was his special effect company in Hollywood, so he was a very important figure in special effects. Uh, Gay Griffith, who was George's assistant. Uh, it's the only interview she's ever done. Interview with Ward Kimball was particularly interesting. Uh, again, this goes back to Disney. I uh, became friends with the nine old men that were alive at Disney. Uh, Ward was one of the four of them. I knew uh, Ward created Jiminy Cricket, mm. Pinocchio. Ward was one of the great uh, geniuses of the Disney Studios. Uh, Walt, the only animator Walt ever said was a genius. The bigger story is that all the animators knew George because of his puppet tunes. Because Walt showed all his puppet tunes to the animators and they had a huge influence of the animation at Disney and Disneyland. And Roy talks about that. Uh, Barbara Eden, who was, uh, of course, I Dream of Jeannie, he was, she was in two George Powell movies. She was in Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe and The Wonderful World of Brothers Grimm. Uh, and she talks uh, glowingly about it, of course. Uh, William Tuttle, who was the makeup artist at MGM, he did the Morlocks for the Time Machine, but he also did the makeup for Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe. And he won the first Academy Award for makeup. There was no makeup award until Seven Faces, by the way. It was because of the Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe that the Academy initiated the Makeup Award, and, and Bill Tuttle got the first award. Uh, Buddy Hackett. Uh, Buddy Hackett's interview has never been seen before. It isn't even in the fantasy film world. So, um, uh, at the time, Buddy was doing uh, had a, a deal at HBO, and he, he couldn't allow the interview to be seen. But now it will be. <laughs> uh, he talks about George in ways that you would never believe hearing from Buddy Hackett. You know Buddy Hackett. Right. You know his personality. Yep. Yeah. Well, you've <laughs> never heard him talk the way he talks. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I mean, yeah, this is uh, this was a one-of-a-kind. Uh, that, that was a one-of-a-kind interview. Oh, Al Nazaki. Al, Albert, Al Nazaki created the War of the Worlds machine that you see in the movie. He created the creature that you see in War of the Worlds. He did all the storyboards for War of the Worlds, the designs. He also happened to have been the production designer for the Ten Commandments. Mm. Bob Baker, who was one of the original animators of the Puppet Tunes, is in the film. He was head of Bob Baker Marionettes, very famous, wonderful guy. Uh, he's in the uh, film. Of course, George Powell is in the film. Uh, footage that was done of George on film. Uh, the only rare, the only I think existing footage of George Powell ever done on film, and it's incorporated into the fantasy film worlds. And I have all of that, and I have more of it on these restorations I'm doing. There's going to be more of George than has been seen before. So that's very important. Uh, 
and let's see who else. Anne Robinson, who was uh, Sylvia Van Buren in War of the Worlds with Jean Barry. She interviews one of her, actually one of her earliest, probably early interviews that she did. Russ Tamblin, who is Tom Thumb in the Brothers Grimm. So most people know him uh, from West Side Story. Okay. Right. But uh, Russ, again, was a pivotal part of George's career. He speaks highly of him. You know, the, the amazing <laughs> thing about, about you talking about these uh, interview subjects is they all held George as um, their mentor. You know what I'm saying? Uh, many of them felt that George was the George had such an effect on so many people in Hollywood, and it just, you know, it just went on and on. You know, his influence went on and on um, to all these other producers, directors, artists. Um, now, those original interviews you originally shot back then on one-inch. Uh, videotape, is that correct? Uh, type B yeah. videotape? Okay. Now that was, uh, was it a rare type of videotape at that point, or uh, was, it a, was it a common format to do interviews on back then? Uh, well, the Bosch company uh, was trying to sell, the Bosch company was trying to sell the one inch concept to the United States. Uh, the Bosch company has been in Europe forever. It's the most popular format in Europe. It's still being used today. But the United States, being the backwards country that it often can be, didn't, didn't, um, didn't grasp onto it, just like they didn't like Betamax over VHS. Betamax was a much better system, but VHS won over its politics mostly. Right. And the Bosch company was trying to sell the B format. In Europe, they use it in the PAL format, and here it was NTSC. Correct. And the NTSC formula didn't go over with the studios. I think a lot of it, it was more expensive. The machines were more expensive. The tape was more expensive. Each roll of tape that I had to buy, and I've got 35 of those tapes, were hundreds of dollars each just to, just to tape the thing. Right. They were very expensive tape. The C format took over in one inch. So they were done in one inch B. Bosch was unable to sell it to the United States. And by the way, the, the reason I did it to begin with, you asked me about this, right? is because of uh, economics. Okay. I, I had a friend, a uh, fellow that I met, Anthony Magliocco was his name. He was running the sales department in Los Angeles for the Bosch company. And I talked to him and he said he would loan me the machine as long as I bought the tape, which was the most expensive, <laughs> you know, and uh, I could do the film. Well, the wonderful thing about that, you see, is it gave me the ability to do all of those interviews. See, I didn't. I was under no constraints. I didn't have to worry about time and studio and all of that. I had the machine, two of them. So anytime I needed it, Anthony would allow the machine to be used. I could do my interview. It gave me a free use of a piece of equipment, you see. I would have liked to have done it on film, of course. I would love to have done it on film, but I, that was it was unaffordable to do right, film. Right. It would have been possible. I would love to have done it on film. Oh, by the way, one of the interviews that um, I forgot to mention is Robert Wise. Okay. I, how I forgot. Yeah. Robert Wise was the president of the Academy at the time, and he wanted to get me into, me into the Academy because of the film. We showed the fantasy film worlds at the Academy for the George Powell Lecture in 1985. And, and Bob was the president. And he introduced it. And I invited Gene Roddenberry to come to be a co-introducer, a co and they both did that. Uh, as a result of that relationship, I became a lifelong friend of Robert Wise. And I can't help but talk about him, because Bob Wise was 
very much a another icon, not just an icon, was the icon of Hollywood, having made the greatest, perhaps, science fiction movie of all time, The Day the Earth Stood Still. The one inch videotape originals that you have, I assume they're in a in a safe place and <laughs> they're they're kept in good condition. But you are now embarking on a process, or you've begun a process, of taking these interview tapes and transferring them to digital files. Is that the process that you're doing right now to preserve them? Yes, exactly. Uh, I put together a GoFundMe campaign to try to fund the process. Uh, I've had to basically most of my own money to do it. I obviously need to get these preserved. Uh, for future generations. Uh, I need to uh, have access for availability for things that I'm doing right now with my current projects as well. But eventually they'll be probably donated to uh, an educational institution or the academy or something like that. Uh, if I don't do them, they'll be lost. So uh, there's not much of a choice here. Um, yeah, they have to be done, otherwise they're, they're gonna sit and be ruined. So, uh, so I've undertaken uh, the digitization of the interviews. Um, the the bugaboo about the whole thing is there's only two machines available in the world that are NTSC B format machines because of the the rarity of the machine. It wasn't something that went over in the United States, and there's only a few of them around. And there's only two working machines in the world. And those two machines I have access to, but they're extremely expensive. To do a one hour transfer is hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, and I've got 30, 40 tapes just added up. So I'm trying to do the tapes as I can, you know, gradually, uh, but I'm, I've been, I need help. I need help. And uh, so I put together a GoFundMe. We've raised close to $2,500. Uh, I put in even money in that campaign myself. Uh, but uh, I, I have a goal of go to a much higher number that I'd like to get to. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's sort of the answer to the, the need I have. Uh, for, it's an urgent, an urgent need, really, to preserve well, these interviews. We're going to make sure that we share, you know, that information so that people can get involved and help preserve these one-inch original tapes. They are the only ones of their kind that exist. So that's that's just, pretty exciting. I'm glad to hear that. But I I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about this project you're working with now to get these interviews. Uh, transfer it, digitized, and preserved for future history. Uh, it's a fantastic project, and you're a wonderful gentleman, and, and thank you for tackling this, and you're the only person that could tackle this. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hoping to share all this information so you can get some funding to get it done. Well, I appreciate, Carl, very much your, your interest. Um, you're not to mention your love for the same thing that I, I'm in love with. Uh, your dedication, your interest in the time machine, having made a time machine yourself. Uh, so I'm, I'm indebted to you and grateful to you for even offering to help. So I appreciate that very much. Well, Arnold, thank you for Skyping in with us today. It was a wonderful interview, and it's, I'm sure it's uh, enlightened many of our viewers. And I hope your projects uh, come to fruition. And we're going to sign off today. Thank you for watching LTV's Top Props.